Dragons, Gazelles, and Unicorns podcast to usher in a new era of tech transfer. My name is Rosemary Truman. I'm the founder and CEO of the Center for Advancing Innovation, and I'm absolutely thrilled to host uh, Ruben today, who will be is one of the leaders in tech transfer, and I believe the world, um, and one of the uh, best people on the planet as well. So with that, Ruben, I'm going to hand it over to you to give your your full name and a little bit of background about yourself. Okay, well, well, with that endorsement, I wholeheartedly jump into the arena here. Uh, my full name is uh, Ruben Flores Saib, and I've been um, formally in the technology transfer space for the last uh, six years, having worked uh, both at the University of California, San Diego, and now at the University of Southern California. Uh, prior to that, my background was in um, industry collaborations, in licensing agreements, uh, and playing roles also in marketing, technology development, and FDA and European product approvals, for, mostly for medical devices and diagnostics. I'm a PhD in biochemis biochemistry from UCLA, and uh, I, I'm an immigrant to this country. I came here in 1994 to get my PhD. Never thought I was going to stay. And we're lucky to have you. Thank you. So, Ruben, um, tell me about how did you get into technology transfer? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, funny enough, you know, at some point in my career in industry, I actually say that tech transfer was a role that I would never take on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what happened is that, you know, uh, during five years that I led the in licensing and scientific collaborations team at uh, what was Merck Millipour, um, I had the opportunity to interact with tech transfer offices all over the world to not only in license products to the company, but also to sponsor research and also to develop a system to be aware of the latest scientific breakthrough developments coming from tech transfer offices all over the world. Um, during that process, I actually saw an opportunity to use my business skills to help facilitate the technology transfer process. Um, so I saw a gap, I saw an opportunity, and when the first opportunity opened up as Vice President of Technology Transfer and Business Development at uh, LA Biomed, which is a nonprofit of Harvard UCLA Medical Center, I decided to do a leap of faith and take on the role. And I haven't looked back since then. Oh, excellent. Well, you know, it's interesting because I came into contact with technology transfer because I also had, I saw an unmet need. When I did growth breakthrough um, strategy at IBM, where I led their innovation strategy practice globally, we would come up with these, you know, things that we think don't exist. And then we would search the databases and we'd find lots of inventions that could actually play a role in this growth breakthrough that we had identified. So similar... Uh, navigation to the to the space. Well, you have been extremely successful in technology transfer. You uh, drove it, it, in San Diego. You drove a fifty percent improvement in startups and and technology transfer licensing. What do you think were the keys to that your success in doing that? It's incredible, um, in, incredibly wonderful progress in a very short period of time. Well, thank you very much, actually. Um, it was a 50% increase in licensing activities, and it was a, a doubling of startup activities. Oh, pardon me. Oh, 100%. my gosh. <laughs> that's okay. No, that's all right. No, no, that's fine. Um, listen, I think that success can be attributed to what I call uh, a social engineering approach to technology transfer. And that comprises of bringing all the right people at the right place at the right time mm. to successfully you know move the technology from inside the walls of the university to the real world and that it means developing the programs the opportunities to meet with entrepreneurs with investors with companies in a setting where investigators and our office uh, tech transfer office feels like or knows that we're going to have some productive um, conversations um, the other key element on that, I believe, it is it was to enable, empower the people doing the deals, the licensing, the groundwork, 
to be successful, empower them to fail, uh, helping them understand that <laughs> most of what we do at Tech Transfer is so cutting edge, is so new that uh, it is uh, very difficult to come up with the most uh, you know, sophisticated, up-to-date financial analysis uh, on putting a valuation on, on the technology. So empowering them to make decisions, empowering them to fail, empowering them to understand that you know, we can do as best as we can with the data that we have and that we need to let it go and <laughs> let the market test the technology, I think are some of the, some of the keys to the success. Um, it also helped, of course, to have you know, um, management that was aligned with the mission of the office and that um, could direct you know, key investigators and key administrators on campus here at USC as well at UCSD to find ways uh, to work productively with the office. With the office, I'm going to stop there now, and and we can continue. So it sounds like what's pivotal here is your leadership because you are enabling your team, the people uh, that you mentioned, the setting that you establish, and the governance and alignment of the management team. If I did, I summarize that succinctly or correctly. Better, much better than I would have done. Yes, okay. thank you. Well, you're welcome. But the, the thing is that, of course, it's, it's a, the foundation is your leadership skills. I, I am very curious, though, about what is it about the setting that you created? Because it's almost sounds like it's a cultural element that where you've combined entrepreneurs with uh, scientific leadership with your team. What, what is the setting that you, you, you laid the foundation of? Well, you know, I, I think... Um... One of the key things that we can do as, as, as leaders, as managers of a group, is we can um, help them envision what the future looks like. Envision a future state and dream about that future state, right? And give them examples of how that future state can be achieved through comparable efforts that are happening elsewhere. Um, I think I did, uh, I know I, I did some of that with my team. At UCSD, I know I'm doing that with my team here at the USC, of course. Um, and that was part of the foundation that I laid out at um, Ella Biomed when I started the first ever, you know, Los Angeles-wide innovation showcase where we started bringing all the, you know, technology transfer offices and all the academic centers in Los Angeles together to, to talk together in a cohesive voice about what we were producing. So the narrative about what's possible combined with real examples of what we can do, um, reaching for the start, dream, you know, dreaming the impossible, and just aiming as high as you can, I think is very important. So I, I think those are some of the elements. Uh, you have to be realistic too as well, right? You have to set realistic expectations and you have to tell people that they're going to fail. Uh, and you have to be very, very upfront with people about these challenges. Mm -hmm. You can't just be a dreamer without keeping your feet on the ground. So um, I think it's a combination. It's a balance of having... You know, some business experience, being a dreamer, you know, being an immigrant to this country, you know, seeing no barriers or obstacles, what others may be seeing barriers or obstacles, and just kind of, you know, breaking out the mold. Yeah, well, you, you, you did break the mold <laughs> um, <laughs> in a very positive way. And so you're, you're saying transparency is really important. That's true. Uh, about, you know, t telling people what's realistic. But I love what you said about reaching for the stars. I mean, many people, they don't even... They just think something is not uh, accessible to them. So they eliminate the opportunity even before they start. I, I also agree. Um, I mean, I, I think you know, I had a podcast one time where I said, Goldman Sachs told me 145 times no. <laughs> and then I got the job. <laughs> so, I mean, people can say no, and they can say no again, and no again. Uh, so I'm completely with you on that one. We should always embrace that thought. Um, I would love to learn more about the innovation council that you established in san diego and sure. how did that come to be um what was the mission you know what 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 were, is it doing now um how do you see it in the five years from now mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much uh, so you know what happened is when i started in san diego um i saw an opportunity to bring together or I had a desire 
and maybe there was an opportunity to, to bring together the academic tech transfer offices with some of the innovation support organizations that were in town, including um, you know, incubators, including uh, investors, including uh, 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 angels, corporate investors, and, and, and the government to highlight and propel together um, you know, what was happening in San Diego in terms of innovation. Actually, you know, like any, like any good story of any startup, we, had, we pivoted a couple of times, right? I mean, the original intent, when I first thought about the, the council, I thought I reached out to organizations like uh, Biocom, Evo Nexus, um, San Diego Venture Group, and others, Connect. Um, and, and I realized that at the time, it was going to be difficult to get those organizations to come together themselves mm -hmm. at the table. They weren't used to that. So mm -hmm. I pivoted and I went back to what I knew. I knew the heads of all the tech transfer offices at the time. And I reached out to every one of them. And luckily, you know, I had a personal relationship with each of them. So when we started talking about getting together and we started to get together, guess what happened? As soon as we, all of us got together for the first time, all these other organizations, Viacom, Connect, <laughs> Evo Nexus, Tech Coast Angels, started paying attention and they say, well, wait a minute, what's going on there? Why, why are you guys talking? We want to be part of it, right? Yeah. Hey, what, what's up? This has never happened. Fear of missing so, out. <laughs> exactly. I think there was a little bit of that. Um, the other thing that was very, very key in the success of moving this forward is that um, we, on, on our pivot, we actually went to the operational people that were actually doing or running a lot of the programs in these organizations, both in tech transfer, as well as some of the organizations that I mentioned. Um, and that was key on actually bringing people to the table that, you know, may have less of a, an agenda and ego and ambitions than other folks. Uh, and I mean that in a, in a positive way. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that it's important to talk about in terms of being able to realize something what we realize because I see similarities now in other, you know, initiatives that I'm running. So that was very important. Um, and number, and the other thing that was very, very important was also to get everybody comfortable with the fact that uh, even though I was representing UCSD or I was employed by UCSD and it's the 800 pound gorilla in town, it was never the intent to have UCSD push around anyone else on what we were going to do, that everybody had an equal foot at the table. Mm -hmm. So that was the culture through which we developed the council originally. Mm -hmm. And now, so that was how we came to be. And now what do we do? So now we have more than 30 supporting organizations, part of the council, right? Including the Alliance for So-Called Innovation, San Diego Entrepreneurs Exchange, Alexander Real Estate Investments, wow. many others. So you can go to the website and, and we just updated the, the number of organizations, 30 or 31. All of these organizations realized that, you know, it's good to come together once a quarter at the table and talk to each other about what we're doing. We're developing that awareness. Mm -hmm. We're uh, cultivating those personal connections through convening. And we are finding synergies and finding opportunities to work with each other. So programmatically what the council does is actually rather limited and that's by design now. So we don't want to do anything that any of the existing organizations that support it already do. Mm -hmm. We don't want to duplicate anything that already, we're not an incubator, we're not a funding mechanism. We are a convening organization that brings everybody together that elevates what it's happening in San Diego and the one event that we do uh, every year is the San Diego Innovation Showcase, which happens on November 6th this year at J Labs for the second year. You are invited. You and everyone, <laughs> all of your listeners are invited to come. Beautiful. Um, we've had, you know, 32 companies every year for the last two years, all of them coming from academic research centers. And we went from 350 attendees the first year to 450 the second year. Uh, we're probably going to cap it around five, 600 because of the venue that we have this year. But it's been super high quality and super well attended. And it's the, the, the one event in San Diego where you have truly, really all the players that play a role in developing the ecosystem. But more importantly, we're bringing investors and entrepreneurs from the Bay Area, from Boston, from Japan, from Europe, from South America to San Diego. 
and they're very interested in what's happening and they really want to continue to, you know, they want to mimic. I guess what I'm realizing is that people coming to San Diego want to sort of mimic and, and, and take with them the innovation spirit that we have in San Diego. You know, you really galvanized the, the ecosystem uh, to, to leverage all the resources that everyone has uh, and, and amplify them. It sounds as if you're doing that. That, that is correct. And, you know, one of the roles that we play in the council is whenever, 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 whenever any organization, entrepreneur, person contacts us, contacts us via the website, we see an opportunity to share that with all the relevant members of the council. Mm -hmm. And we just, you know, give, it's like a concierge service, if you will, mm -hmm. right? You come to one place, you know that you have a reach of 30 different organizations. Awesome. You know that yeah. your questions are going to be direct to the right organization. Yeah. And that's what we do basically, right? I, I mean, that's fantastic. I see a lot of ecosystems where there are the, the, the parts of the ecosystem are siloed. There is, uh, there is duplication. There is, um, and when there's duplication, of course, some of the resources are underutilized and, and it's almost, it's competitive. And, and that venue or that, even that email list of, uh, having all of them on the same email to communicate what's going on, who's communi who's engaging with you, what are they asking? It's also very interested, uh, interesting, I'm sure, to, to hear the questions that you're getting. And I'm sure they're, they're looking for the secret sauce. And something that you said, I, I would like to put a point on because I, I think that this is, this is also why I said at the very beginning of this podcast, you're an awesome human being. You have the ability to create these personal relationships that go beyond politics or bureaucracy, but you, you actually not just get to know people on a professional level and say, okay, what's in it for me, but you also get to know them on a personal level, which I think um, allows you a, a different playing field. So uh, kudos on that. Well, thank you for that. I, 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 uh, I realized that, thank you. Um, I, I, you're right. Uh, I do have a um, tendency and a curiosity to really get to know and understand my fellow human beings, their drivers, <laughs> their motivations, what makes them who they are. Uh, you know, I have a very colored background myself, very diverse background, made of many, many little parts and pieces, uh, culturally, you know, genetically, you know, professionally. So uh, I'm always interested in understanding, you know, where people, uh, what people are made out of. Yeah, I remember when I was in your office, I think you were talking about different kinds of music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like, yeah, from country to metal to, you yeah. know, Latin rock to jazz to classical. Yeah. I enjoy them all in, at different times. So um, to, just to get to the point of this podcast, it's a new era of tech transfer, and I believe you're paving the way in this, in this in, to create this. I'd love to get your point of view on what do you believe needs to happen to transform, to create the next era of tech transfer? Wow. So I think in the next era of tech transfer, there will be more relationships between universities and research centers and strategic investor groups looking to put resources, uh, technologies that are coming out of the university at an early stage. Um, I mentioned that after we signed that agreement at UCSD with, for example, Deerfield, which is publicly known, a commitment to invest up to $65 million over five years on specific technologies coming out of the university. Um, I think that is the future. Uh, and I, I think that's gonna be an opportunity for uh, not only investors, but strategic companies and others to come together and, you know, sit at the table and help drive, you know, innovations coming out of the university. Um, I think, uh, you know, there are certainly uh, reform <laughs> that is needed in terms of, you know, at the federal, law, at the federal government in terms of, you know, making the, the process uh, simpler in terms of the, not only the, the licensing of, of, of technologies, but also the reporting process, which can be actually cumbersome. And, and the reason why I bring that up, although it's, it's very, you know, sort of almost not interesting to anybody, it actually becomes an issue on 
how do you think about structuring a deal and enabling a startup or a company to work on a, on a license and report back to the university? If we can streamline that, that will be also very useful for the companies and, and, for, and, and for the country. And, and also, I think, you know, uh, as the tech transfer offices become more savvy, we're seeing uh, many people who have an, a background in, in business to come back to tech transfer and you know start to play a very important prominent role in technology transfer offices. So I think that's the next stage. That's the next you know evolution. That's as far as I can see it right now. I mean, I do have, of course, you know, pipe dreams, but uh, you know, I that those would be just wily speculations, right? Wild speculations, you know. So, um, so three things. One is for the universities out there looking to or hospitals out there looking to try to engage with one of these investors, how do you spot one of the investors that are at the forefront of this trend? Of the particular technology or, or yeah, tool that the, they're... You mentioned the $65 million uh, investment that the one firm was making, an investment firm was making um, in partnership with the university. You sure. Know, universities looking, at, looking to find a partner like that. How do they find one? So like you and I knowing each other it's all about the personal relationships right certainly the university and the organization provides the the name and the credentials but it's all going to be about the personal relationships so I don't think there's a secret sauce or a mechanism where we all can call you know a fund and they're going to open the door just because I say I come from USC or, or UCSD or Harvard right Mm -hmm. There has to be a personal connection. Uh, we cannot, we can never lose sight of that. So I think cultivating or bringing, you know, staff on board that has developed successful connections with, you know, the industry or the funds that the university wants to, you know, develop a relationship with is going to be key. You're going to have to have the right people who know the right people in the right places. And, you know, and that's going to be the most effective way to, bring partnerships to the table because you know it doesn't matter how successful you've been in, in other fields if you don't have those relationships you are not going to be as successful right yeah and the other thing that i uh completely agree with is the the need for streamlining the deal making process and sure. reporting on the back end so we work with about a hundred institutions uh around the united states and also some in europe and that process is extremely diff different based on who you're dealing with. It's not only the tech transfer group that you're dealing with, but it's actually the person. Correct. <laughs> the person correct. within the group, because one person has a different style than another person. So that is correct. My pipe dream, and it's a really big one, is it's all the same. It's like <laughs> all the same. There's no, there's no guessing. Variations. It's gonna look yeah. like, you know, it's almost as if. Um, I use this analogy of getting buying Oreos, you know. So I go to the so I make like if I make a hundred grand a year, I go to the store and buy Oreos to cost three dollars. If somebody who has makes five million dollars a year and they go to the store and buy to buy Oreos, it costs them a million dollars. I don't whatever it costs, but but uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of uh, an art and a science in the deal making process, and then there's the whole governance around it. So I would. I would love to see that uh, our taxpayer dollars, you know, they're, we spend 140 to 160 billion dollars a year on in this R&D and, and so do the institutions. I'd love to see us be able to um, standardize and get some of those inventions out and create new markets to create knowledge-based jobs, to amplify entrepreneurial ecosystems. Anyway, I'm getting my little- No, 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 I, 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 agree with, I agree with you. And can I comment on that a little bit? Yes, please. Yes, no, I, I agree with you. Uh, and listen, you know, technology transfers are relatively new you know, business, right? Since mm -hmm. 81, since Bay Dole, and some universities had it before then, but it's a relatively new business that is evolving. Uh, and I agree with you, each, <laughs> each university, even within the UC system, even here in LA, each university is different from the other. And the culture is different from the other. And the people in my office are different from the other. That's not that dissimilar that when you're doing, dealing with different companies, right? I think you're right. You go to Medtronic, you go to, you know, Pfizer, you go to Lilly, you're going to find very different cultures, very different people, very different ways of doing business. Um, 
And the other thing that is, is challenging is, again, because we have such novel technologies in our, in our hands, um, when we ask the partner, okay, you know, just share with us, how do you envision this technology working into mm -hmm. your pipeline and being developed? Sometimes the answer are going to be different from the prior one. They're, they're going to have to right. think about novel ways in which they need to develop the product, partner funding, what have you. And that's what leads uh, a little bit to the, to the delays. Right. Now, clearly, clearly, if we could just have a template online that everybody agreed to and everybody could sign it, I would tell you I would be the, the, the number one person to be the happiest. Uh, I think, you know, one of the initiatives that we, we've been talking about is to put the IP on the, on the uh, cloud, on the, on the blockchain, mm -hmm. basically, uh, and do click-through agreements in the blockchain. Again, it becomes a matter of how do you keep track of the products that are asked for this agreement and how do you report but it may be doable, you know, with technology in the future. The point is, you know, how do you make the role of the technology transfer uh, professional more of a, that consensus relationship builder and bringing the parties to the table and the negotiation part a lot less sort of, you know, difficult, problematic or what have you, right? Um, the other thing is, you know, realistically, when you present a uniform template to companies that want to license a technology from the university, they often say, well, no, 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 that doesn't work for me. I need to change it. Yeah. <laughs> and and it, it works both ways, right? So yeah, it, does. it is so dynamic. It's so different. There's so many things happening. But if there was a way we could fix it, I I'm with you. I would love to fix it. I mean, it is the art and the science of the deal as well. I, Correct. I, I understand. And it's interesting because when we evaluated the NASA portfolio, uh, I'll never forget because the, some of the inventions, we had to think of 15 different applications and each of those applications for each invention had to be evaluated separately because they have a completely different market, different, completely different competitive landscape, et cetera, et cetera. And it had a completely different value. Um, right. <laughs> made for, for anti-gravity, we're looking for terrestrial uses. So, um, uh, speaking of NASA, they have come up with a, a startup licensing agreement that's very simple, um, mm -hmm. and the centers are are working to implement that. And and I know you have you have done that in the past as well. Uh, are are you doing that now? At USC? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, We're yeah, we, we we have very you know uh, startup friendly agreement terms that we we already use at USC. Excellent. I think what, what we need to do is we need to kind of just create more awareness that we have those tools here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, the whole idea behind working with a startup is that you want to facilitate their ability to develop that technology and make sure that they use their hard earned dollars towards technology development and not towards paying any kind of upfront fees. Right, right, right. So that's, that's, the, that's the basic gist of it, right? How do you help them minimize the upfront cost, you know, and help them develop the technology? So, Ruben, is there any last thing that you want to leave the listeners with today that I didn't ask you? A pearl Brother, <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to go back to what you were saying, actually, regarding um, dealing with different tech transfer offices. I've, I've taught a, a course at the Licensing Executive Society meeting on industry academic relationships. And having been on board now, here's what I tell people in industry. When you go and deal with tech transfer, um, realize what you have realized. You're gonna have a very different approach depending on who you, who you work with, who you deal with. Try to get over that really quickly and try not to focus on how do you change the culture mm -hmm. of the tech transfer office because not even a chancellor or a president is gonna be successful over years of working to, to, to change that culture. And you need the deal done. Mm -hmm. Focus on the deal. Focus on, you know, you, you need this business term done. You need to get the deal done. Focus on working through whichever processes you need to work with to get the deal done. And I tell the same to tech transfer offices, right? None of these industries is evil and they want to take advantage of us. No, 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 no. You need to get a deal done. Yes. Indus industry, <laughs> is here, industry is here to develop the product and make it happen. Uh, and we cannot survive without them. So get your deal done and none of these you know, we're evil, industry is evil or what have you. So <laughs> the message is for industry and tech transfer both, right? Hey, just focus on the deal. Uh, try to not get distracted by all the, you know, sort of, you know, specters of, you know, preconceived notions of who we are, where we come from and just focus on the deal. Get it done, move on to the next one. 
Excellent. Well, Ruben, I cannot thank you enough for being on the podcast today. I'm very, very grateful for your time and your valuable insights. And I know you're paving uh, the path for the new era of technology transfer. And thank you for being on our inaugural uh, podcast for dragons, gazelles, and unicorns. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you for all the work that you and your organization is doing to help, you know, take technologies to the marketplace. Thank you.